My message today is crossing bridges. Crossing bridges. This is my last sermon for this Building the World We Dream About series that I've been doing. Um, now March 8th is going to be related because March 8th, one of the two weeks from now when I am up here, we're going to be doing a uh, special service celebrating protest songs. So it will be related. And I invite any of you to have a special protest song that you want us to lift up to let me know. Or especially if you've got one you'd like to sing, to please let me know. Or play, and we'll try to inc include those as well. But this is my last sermon on this. And that's entitled Cross and Bridges. Um, because I wanted to focus on some of the things that you may be hearing about coming up this week and later on next week. And, on, and also think about how this could have meaning in our lives. Now, in my own life, I've been crossing many more bridges lately. As you all know, I'm now half-time here, and I serve half-time in Brunswick. So I'm living in two places, and when I go back and forth, it's kind of metaphorical that I have to cross these bridges going back and forth, down to Brunswick, Georgia. And I especially love the bridges on the Taurus Causeway. This causeway was uh, named after the, the engineer that initially connected St. Simons Island with Brunswick back in the 20s. Then in the 80s, they enlarged it, four-laned it, and built these beautiful bridges that, it's just exhilarating. So you're going across these bridges and you can't really see the other side, you know, and as you go across, it's almost like you're on a roller coaster, but you're driving the car instead <laughs> of, could be a little bit dangerous, I guess. A little, you know, so it gives, gives a little bit of risk, but yet you know you're in control too. And it's a really cool feeling. I like crossing bridges if they're not too high. It's fun. And if I know there are no troubles underneath, perhaps. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking about it a lot because I've been crossing a lot of bridges. And those are fun to cross when I go over to St. Simons. But some bridges are not so easy to cross sometimes, are they? Some bridges we hesitate on. We don't think we want to cross. We're not too sure about crossing the river. It's kind of like way back when, when the Israelites, after they finally got to the Promised Land, uh, some went across the river and to explore, and then they came back and said, oh no, we don't need to go, it's too scary, we shouldn't go now. Then they spent 40 more years wandering the desert till all of those folks could die off, <laughs> to the ones that were ready to cross could cross. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fear sometimes people have about moving on sometimes. So some of these bridges that we have fears about or have concerns about crossing are personal bridges, and some are bridges that we must cross as a congregation, as a society. Some of them, many of them are metaphorical bridges, of course. Some are real. Some are real bridges. And here is the real bridge you'll hear a lot about uh, this week as we come to the 50th anniversary of the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, as you listen this week, you'll probably hear a lot about these things in next week and the week after and coming into March. Or if you saw the movie Selma, just lift your hand if you've seen it. Okay. That movie, I think, is an excellent movie. Now, it's true that there are some historical inaccuracies about some of the folks in the movie, you know, or whatever. But it's not a documentary, so keep that in mind. It's not a documentary. It's sharing the story of it. So it does share that story well, I, I think. That's my opinion. Others have different opinions. But you'll be seeing other things as well. Now here's a little bit of a timeline, though, to, as you hear about this stuff coming up. Um, actually, the first thing on the timeline is already passed, February 18th. But February 18th, 50 years ago, is when unarmed J uh, Jimmy, Lee Jane, Jimmy Lee Jackson was beaten and shot. He was trying to defend his mother. They were in this black-owned cafe after they had the peaceful protests and they were being chased and he ran in there um, and he died seven days later. Now the idea for the march from Selma to Montgomery came up at his funeral. Some people actually wanted to take his body with them, you know, but they did not do that, of course. But that's where it started, the, so let's, let's march, we're upset. The, the, the uh, protest was about voting rights. In Selma, which was very greatly, I, I forgot the percentage, but you know, like 80% or something, African American, but very few were voting. I may be wrong with that statistic. Very few were voting, uh, were allowed to vote. So that's what the protest was about. 
And then after he was killed, there was this idea, let's go on a march. Let's march to Montgomery. So March 7th is when they marched, tried to march. They tried to cross this bridge. It's also known as Bloody Sunday. Josiah Williams and John Lewis were leading 600 marchers across this Edmund Pettus Bridge. They were met by tear gas, horses, advancing troopers, and many of them were beaten, including John Lewis from Georgia, as you all know John Lewis. Dr. King then, who was not there at that march, he responded to the attack, though, by calling on religious leaders throughout the nation to join him for the march on March 9th. Now, I was not a Unitarian Universalist at the time. Uh, Martha may have been. No? Okay. But my understanding from those who were was the Unitarian Universalists all stood up and said, yes, we will go. The ministers went back to their congregation and said, we will provide the funds for you to go. And many, many of them joined, went down to Selma to join in the march. And other religious leaders as well. Well, then on March 9th, they attempted again. This is also called Turnaround Tuesday. This time, King was there. He was leading 1,500 marchers and clergy. They were facing state troopers. He, they kneeled down, he knelt down, prayed, and then started singing, We Shall Overcome, turned around, and went back to the Brown Chapel in Selma. Now that evening, you ministers were attacked after leaving a restaurant. Reverend James Reed, a Unitarian Universalist minister, dies two nights later. Getting much media attention from all over the nation. When Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed, people didn't hear about it that much. But the white minister goes down there, the word spreads throughout. <laughs> And people think, what is going on down there? And they got a lot of attention. Now, many people wonder what happened on Turnaround Tuesday. Why did they turn around? Some information said that this was something that King had worked out with the authorities and with the Johnson administration. They were not ready. They had not sent the troops yet. If they had gone through, it would have been a, probably another bad situation, bloody situation. So working it out with Johnson and the troopers knew what was going to happen too. They made the attempt, went, they gave, had permission to pray, turned around and went back. There's, there's a picture of James Reed, the minister that was killed that night. Then finally on March 21st through 25th was the March to Montgomery. Martin Luther King leads March designated as a protest of Jimmy Lee Jackson and, uh, and Reverend James Reed. So he brought Jimmy Lee Jackson's death, lifted that back up again. Remember, he died too. And James Reed, protesting them both. President Johnson sent 2,000 federal troops to allow the march. Now that wasn't one of the things emphasized in the movie, you know, but it happened too. <clears throat> and 4,000 marchers begin in Selma with 25,000 marchers finishing up in Montgomery. So, you may have seen the movie, or you may be going to see the movie, but I wanted you to see a little of the actual footage. And I found this eight minute video which shows the first attempt and the third successful crossing with some music. And I think it allows you to see some of the feelings that were going on, some of the um, ideas, and I, I hope this doesn't bother people too much, but it's a real showing of what happened 50 years ago. i 
constant struggle.
We had one more UU martyr during this time. Viola Liutsu. She was a Detroit homemaker and a member of a UU congregation there. She answered the call for volunteers, went down to Selma to help with the organization. She used her own vehicle to transport people from the airport or bus stations to Selma and then took her car then to Montgomery and used her vehicle to transport people back to Selma, back to airports, bus stations. She was shot by the Klan while she was in a car doing that. What are the lessons that we've learned from Selma? It's been 50 years. Surely we've learned some lessons about bridge crossing and the lessons from Selma. We'll have a discussion after our break time and some of you can share what you think are some of the lessons. Here's some things that I thought about. When we have difficult bridges to cross, we have to realize that sometimes sacrifices must be made. Hopefully not as big a sacrifices as were made by Viola and James Reed, but sacrifices sometimes must be made as we make transitions in life. Sometimes we have to make compromises. And sometimes, especially when it's some ethical or moral thing we're standing up for, or when we feel we're right, we don't want to make any compromises. But if Martin Luther King had not been willing to make some compromise and wait and do some things, they would never have made the march successful. Sometimes you have to make some compromises. This is one I think is so important. And that is, it is important to know your power and the power of others. Don't ignore that. As we have attempted, for instance, to move forward with marriage equality, we've had to think about how to do that best. And those of you that are uh, members of the Human Rights Campaign know that they finally decided we, we just need to go a state-by-state -state strategy. We need to know where we have power and where we don't have power and how we can go about it. So they went back and used a different strategy, trying to figure out how they could have power within some smaller courts. And look at the success. So know your power and the power of others as you attempt to cross bridges. Strong leadership is vital. During the Civil Rights Movement, and this shows up in the movie, they do portray this. There were different factions, all working towards civil rights, but disagreeing about how to go about it. And before King was on the scene at Selma, they were very divided about it. It took some strong leadership to come in and try to have people, people know that some of you have got to make some compromises if we're going to do this. We've got to work together for the greater good, for the bigger goal. And we need to have a clear sense of where we are going before crossing the bridge. Sometimes we know we need to make a change and we just dart out. I know I need to make a change. This is not good. Where am I going, though? I'm just wandering in the desert, you know, like the Israelites. We need to have a clear sense of where we're going before crossing the bridge. And maybe they needed to wander a while longer. Sometimes we have to do that. Let me go wander a while longer before I cross that bridge. And then, an important lesson is that peaceful crossings are possible. I worry, worry, worry when I see the news about what's going on in the Middle East and what's going on now in Ukraine, especially with Greg being right across the place he's in in Russia, is right there where the refugees are coming in. And I thought, don't they know there's some peaceful way to do this? Does it have to be violent? And I apologize. I didn't think about it later for the goat budding the troll off the... I should have come up with a peaceful way to make the troll go away. <laughs> I'll stick it to the store. There has to be peaceful crossings, peaceful ways to make it happen. That's what we hope for. And then coming up from that wonderful protest song, 
that was made into a series, of course, that you can still see on PBS and uh, on Netflix, I suppose, and other kind of ways. Keep your eyes on the prize. Sometimes all the little in-between things and the small details keep us from crossing because we're not looking for that greater good, that greater goal. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Now, there are a lot of bridges that we cross. It's volume down a little bit. A lot of bridges that we cross in our lives. Some are real, some are metaphorical, some are symbolic. You see on the left, that happened Friday night here, right here. It was a wonderful celebration. Sorry you men weren't invited. <laughs> but we women were here and we watched Abby cross that bridge from being a child to being a maiden to a teenager to celebrate her 13th birthday. On the right, we see Annalisha when she graduated last year, graduated from high school. That was a big transition. She was leaving us. So she crossed that bridge out of my house on Memorial Day, metaphorically. And of course, coming up, I suppose I'll see my own grandchild walk across that bridge as well. And many of you may be able to see your children do it. Walking across the bridge, making the transitions. But as we think about making these transitions, we also think about there are things that we need to think about and hold true and try to get ourselves ready for it. How can we have the confidence to do it when we know it's a big transition? We have some bridges that we need to cross in our personal lives. They may be bridges related to where we're living, bridges related to relationships, bridges related to our work, our families. But how do we get across? How do we get the confidence to take that first step? Sometimes it's taking that first step that gives it to us. Just stepping up on the bridge might do it. What do we do about those troubled waters that we know are underneath there? And the troll. And the troll. <laughs> how do we handle the troll? We have to have a plan. And just so, the same thing's true of our congregation. That's why we call it a bridge loan. We said, we want to start on the building, but we don't have the money yet because we haven't sold our building yet. Oh, well, maybe we can find some way to bridge it. And many of you helped us out by loaning what you could, and now we're making good progress out there. We got a plan how to get across that bridge. And then in our society, we want to work for a more peaceful, just world. Maybe starting here at home. We're meeting on Wednesday night. Some of you are coming. And we're looking at how we can become a more anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural congregation. It's not too late to join us. We're trying to figure out how to cross that bridge, how to get us there. It can be done. It can be done peacefully, right? So come join us. And come join us in this congregation. We were going to have a joining ceremony today, but it turned out that some of the folks who were involved with that couldn't be here. So we have put it out off now to March 29th. That'll be after I come back from Russia. If you're not a part of this congregation, we invite you to come and join us and help us cross those bridges to become a vehicle, a bridge ourselves for change. And what are the bridges we're laying down? Well, the bridge that we say we lay down here at Unitarian Universal Fellowship of States for is right here. It's the love bridge. That's what a bridge is, after all. A bridge is a connection. And what better connection than love? We stand on the side of love. Standing on the side of love, making those connections with one another. Oh, may it be so. Amen.